steering committee and directs the Parker Lab of Social Neurosciences Research. Uh, the principal goal of her research is to better understand the biology of social functioning across the range of species and to translate these fundamental insights to drive development of novel diagnostic tools to detect and precision medicine to treat um, social impairments in patient populations. The findings from her research have led to two patent applications and have frequently been recognized by Spectrum in the annual top 10 list of studies that change the field of autism. She received her undergraduate and graduate degrees from University of Michigan, completed a postdoc at Stanford University. She joined the Stanford faculty in 2007, um, and she is affiliated with the California National Primate Research Center and elected a member of the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology and the Cavill Fellow of the US uh, National Academy of Sciences. Uh, she's supported by many uh, federal and private uh, foundations. And so with that, I will uh, let her take it away and tell us about vasopressin. Thanks for the kind introduction, Rich. It's good to see you virtually. Um, let me, oh, I think you need to stop. Yeah, there we go. All right. It's always a challenge to be the speaker keeping you guys from lunch. So I'm going to try to keep it lively here. All right. Um, so the nice thing about speaking to um, an autism community is autism needs very little introduction. I'm gonna keep it brief, um, but make a couple key points. So as we all know, autism is diagnosed on the basis of two core features. Um, the main one that we'll be focusing today is on these persistent social communication and interaction challenges as well as the presence of restricted repetitive behaviors. Autism is clinically heterogeneous and has a variety of um, behavioral, medical, um, and cognitive comorbidities. Currently, the diagnosis of autism is based on phenomenology, so signs, symptoms, course of um, illness. And because it's poorly understood biologically, there are no robust neurochemical markers to make the diagnosis, unlike other aspects of medicine. And we have no standard of care laboratory-based tests currently. Um, in terms of treatments, um, we have behavioral therapies. There are only two drugs approved by the FDA to treat autism, which treat um, associated features like irritability and have negative side effect profiles. These are two antipsychotics and zero that treat the core features presently. But the point I wanna to make to sort of set the talk is that this lack of medication options for autism um, is due is due to the drug development crisis more generally. And so 90% of central nervous system or brain medications fail in clinical trials. So we've um, drugs that were wildly effective in animal models, mostly rodent models fail when we test them in patients. And 50 to 80% of these medication failures can be attributable to selection of poor animal models. And this is particularly true for rodent models which even when genetically engineered often don't recapitulate the core symptoms that we would be interested in treating. Um, for us, when, we came, when I came to the field, I was interested in thinking about this opportunity to develop a refined animal model that had um, higher translational potential. So today in my talk, I'll be speaking to you about this translational research program that we initiated, which began with developing a valid animal model of autism, translating these findings to people with autism, and then testing a medication based on the biology that we had discovered. So when we started thinking about animal model development, we really held ourselves to a high standard. We wanted the onset to be neurodevelopmental, just like autism, so symptoms emerge early in childhood. And we wanted what's called face validity, which is the outward similar, similarity in appearance between the model's attributes and patient symptoms. So this would involve a complex social cognition impairments in a highly social, diurnal, meaning day active species with vision as its primary sensory modality. We were also interested in establishing what's called construct validity, which is it's the similarity to the underlying causes of the disease. So in the past, we were interested in these spontaneous 
um, natural social deficits. So autism in primates had been previously modeled using brain lesions or um, peer rearing where you would remove the parents and the baby would be reared in isolation, which um, modeled more particularly situations like Romanian orphanage rearing. And so we thought that if we could see spontaneous social impairments, um, that we could better model um, autism. And what we wanted was what we call homolo homologous genes and circuits. So it means that the biology that we're interested in in our animal model would be conserved evolutionarily in the animal and the patients. And then we also wanted predictive validity, which is the model's ability to identify and evaluate drugs for therapeutic safety and efficacy. And so two sort of um, lessons learned from the past, drugs are often tested in what I'll call neurotypical animals. So they don't even have the um, target behaviors we're interested in modifying. And then other drugs have been tested in species like thalidomide, which caused severe birth defects. And that was only tested in rodents. It was deemed safe and then was tested and had disastrous consequences in humans. And when we went back and tested this in marmoset monkeys and, and in rhesus macaques, we saw the actual birth defects. And so having a model um, that's closely related to humans can also help with safety. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that our animals were housed in complex social housing in species typical enrichment so that if we saw social impairments, they weren't the result of adverse lab conditions. And so for us, these criteria pointed to the value in developing a primate model. Um, and so when we started thinking about points of entry for um, model validation translational strategies, I was interested in thinking about behavior in these core features. And an observation that was made, you know, probably about 20 years ago by John Constantino was that autistic traits are common, heritable, and con continuously distributed in the general population. And so what we were interested in was taking a behavior first, first approach and identifying naturally occurring social um, impairments in rhesus monkeys. And then I'll tell you a little bit after that, once we created the model about our biomarker discovery and translation of these biomarkers from animals to people. So we decided to pick old world monkeys because they outside of um, apes were the most closely related to humans. And um, we focused on rhesus macaques, which are highly social. They have complex social cognition abilities that have been well demonstrated. They have vision as their primary sensory modality. They exhibit stable individual differences in social behavior. And we knew from some earlier work that they had spontaneous social deficits. And so I took the show on the road to the California National Primate Research Center, which is about 100 miles from Stanford, and it has 5,000 um, rhesus monkeys that are housed outdoors in these very large field corrals, so half acre field corrals. They live in mixed complex groups and they consist of all ages and you can study them across the lifespan. Um, we've developed over time three ways to identify monkeys with naturally occurring social deficits. So one is to go out and do fo focal animal sampling. Um, and we've created a quantitative non-social index. So what we do is observe the animals quantitatively, and then we're able to identify animals at the extremes of this very large population. We also reverse translated the social responsiveness scale. Um, which we call the macaque social responsiveness scale. And, um, and so this was an instrument that we've used in many of our um, clinical trials previously. And we're able to show that we could also see um, high SRS scores in these um, very low social animals that have these spontaneous impairments. And we've also um, developed a variety of behavioral tests that I don't, I don't have time to go into where we can ask questions about very specific behaviors that are altered in people with autism and ask if our low social monkeys possess them. Um, so I'm just going to give you a broad overview. All of this work is published. We've done, we've done it over the about the last 10 years. But what we found is that these low social monkeys have behavioral features quite relevant to human autism. So um, they have a greater burden of autistic-like traits on the macaque social responsiveness scale. We see um, on these detailed behavioral tests involving eye tracking, abnormal, um, abnormalities in species, typical perception and reaction to social stimuli. 
Um, in the home cage, we see impairment in reciprocal social interactions and particularly in pro-social initiation of behaviors that are critical um, for this species, um, particularly grooming. Um, we did a medical record review and showed that um, these low social monkeys have greater traumatic injuries and greater bullying by, peer, uh, by peers, which worsen with their autistic-like trait burden. And we've also had um, some good success with identifying subtle social information processing deficits in very young rhesus monkeys that predict with 100% accuracy this low social phenotype later in adulthood. So then we were next interested so that since we had this robust animal model in um, conducting some biomarker discovery. And so what we did was um, we had groups of low social and high social monkeys, and we made measurements that I was interested in having direct and immediate streamlined translation. And I was particularly interested in cerebral spinal fluid because in neurology diseases such as uh, multiple sclerosis and a variety of dementias, um, have their neurochemical signatures most ro robustly evident in spinal fluid. And so when we began this research, I was interested in evaluating biological signaling pathways in both spinal fluid and blood um, for um, neurochemical systems that had been implicated in pro-social behaviors in mammals, which include two related neuropeptides, oxytocin and arginine vasopressin. And so I'll, going forward, call this either, you'll see AVP on my slide, you might see vasopressin, you might see arginine vasopressin, it's the same thing. Um, and these had been implicated in um, pro-social behavior. And then there were a couple um, different kinase signaling pathways, which had been implicated in um, syndromic forms of autism. Um, 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 that are listed here. And so when we put all these biomarkers in the hopper and we basically just said, can you classify in a machine learning approach? We could do so with 93% accuracy, but we didn't know at the time what biology was driving this differentiation between high and low sociality. And so then we did a logistic regression, which basically asked which of these are the most important drivers. And what we found was um, we saw that spinal fluid levels of vasopressin, but not blood levels, um, and two pieces of these kinase signaling pathways could with very high accuracy differentiate high and low social monkeys. But if we think that this is a potential driver in these group differences, we'd want to see group differences in their, the neurochemical levels. And we only saw this for CSF levels of vasopressin. Um, and so what I also want to do is point out here is that um, vasopressin in the brain has been known for quite some time as selectively regulating pro-social behavior in male mammals. And what's interesting is our current understanding of autism is that autism is much more prevalent in males than females. And I found this quite interesting that we saw these impairments potentially in the signaling pathway in these male animals. So we also did some additional work showing that um, vasopressin levels um, were highly uh, correlated with time spent in social grooming, uh, which is a key socially motivated feature um, for macaques, and it requires high levels of social competence to perform successfully. Um, and what we would like to know with a biomarker is that it would be stable. And so we did this, um, we measured vasopressin levels in spinal fluid in macaques on four different occasions across a four month period. And on the X axis, what you can see is the individual monkeys and what you can see on the Y axis is the CSF vasopressin. And what you can also see is that we see these individual difference, differences across monkeys and CSF vasopressin is highly stable within individuals. And then in a replication cohort, what we found was that just knowing CSF level of vasopressin um, could, would allow us to correctly classify monkeys um, 28 out of 30 times by just knowing CSF vasopressin alone. So there's been a lot of work done, particularly with funding from the Simons Foundation on high confidence autism susceptibility genes. There's been about 100 identified currently, but vasopressin isn't one of them. And so one of the questions I get frequently is, well, what do you think is going on if this robust effect happens so often in all the animals you're studying? And so we were interested in asking, maybe it's a common pathway. And so there's been a lot of speculation that these genes summon and interact 
to converge on a few common pathways and vasopressin could potentially be one of them. And so what we asked was, is it possible that CSF levels of vasopressin are responsible for these individual differences in autistic-like trait burden. And we weren't able to do this study in people, but we were in monkeys. And what we showed was that the macaque social responsiveness scale is continuously distributed. And very interestingly, the, um, and this score, this is um, a, a reverse scale, a reverse scored scale. So the lower your CSF vasopressin levels, the greater your autistic trait symptom um, severity. So low social monkeys are not people with autism. And so one of the possibilities was that this might have limited insights into ASD. And so what we did was ask, does the biology translate to patients? And so um, with some Herculean effort, we went and we um, pulled together a bunch of different research groups and kind of a boots on the ground um, effort, we're able to get, um, uh, spinal fluid samples from kids with and without autism. And what we were able to show was that in our first cohort, we could correctly classify 13 out of 14 children by just knowing their CSF vasopressin level alone. And as you can see here, we saw um, significantly um, that the uh, people with autism had much lower CSF vasopressin levels. And um, we were, uh, and, and a limitation of this study was that all these kids were coming in for other reasons to get a spinal tap. And so we were able to uh, pair up with Sue Sweeto at, um, at the National Institute of Health, where she had been doing um, a research study collecting spinal fluid as part of a research indication in very well characterized kids with autism. And we were able to um, replicate this finding and show that vasopressin levels were much lower in children with autism. And because Sue had all of these um, nice clinical assessments, we were able to show that the lower your CSF vasopressin level, the greater your social symptom severity um, on the ADOS severity, uh, symptom severity index. Um, what I will point out here as a little bit of a teaser is that the vasopressin was most closely related to social symptom severity and not the restricted repetitive behaviors. And because autism is so clinically heterogeneous, I think this points toward the need to do multiplex protein profiling to think of a biological signature, not only for autism in general, but potentially for subtypes. And I also want to point out that at least in older children, we've done some work in blood. We saw no group differences when we measure blood uh, vasopressin in blood. So neurotypical children and children with autism do not differ when we look at vasopressin in blood. So the next study we did was the kids that we had been studying so far had been behaviorally symptomatic and already diagnosed. And I knew that John Constantino at WashU had a um, kind of a rare one of a kind biospecimen archive of neonatal infants who had come in to get um, spinal taps for mild viral infections. And so um, I asked John, could we, could we do a medical record review? And so what we were able to do in a quasi perspective way was to go into medical records and identify children who as neonatal infants before the time when autism first manifests. So these were kids that were zero to three months of age. Could we ask you know, and then we followed these kids in their medical records up to 12 years of age, and we could identify a subset who had autism and a subset who went on to develop typically. And really excitingly, what we saw was that vasopressin levels in children who were behaviorally asymptomatic already showed this biomarker um, signal. We did not see it in CSF oxytocin. So what I want to do is make the point here that there's been an extraordinary amount of interest in oxytocin, something I'm also happy to talk about in the Q&A, but in every single study we've done, both in rhesus monkeys and in all of our patient-based studies, oxytocin levels never differ in CSF, but they always differ um, in with vasopressin. And so what we know here, at least in looking at these two related peptides, is that this isn't a a general altered signature of brain neurochemistry because the oxytocin levels don't differ, right? And so um, this also gives us gave us some thinking about um, 
maybe where we could go with a treatment trial. And then I just want to point out here in the five ASD cases that we had that um, had fewer medical comorbidities later um, in life, what we saw here was this very stark separation between the kids who developed typically and the kids who went on to be diagnosed with autism. Okay, so this of course raised the very exciting possibility that vasopressin could be a possible therapeutic for autism. And what we know from um, a study that was done by um, Jan Born's group in Europe was that you could um, sniff neuropeptides and what we can see is an increase in spinal fluid levels of vasopressin. And we don't exactly know how intranasal vasopressin um, targets the brain. There are several hypotheses that it might travel along the trigeminal pathway, the olfactory um, nerve pathway, or it may enter um, the brain indirectly through the blood capillary stream. But what we did know when we started our work was that single doses of vasopressin in healthy humans, so this is intranasally delivered, enhanced memory for social information, identification of social words, and cooperative behavior. But no prior research before our study had tested the safety or efficacy of intranasal vasopressin to improve social abilities in children with autism. Um, and so I teamed up with my um, colleague, Antonio Hardin at Stanford, who runs um, the, many of the clinical trials for children with autism. And so we came up with several specific aims for this initial um, phase 2A um, clinical trial that was randomized double-blind placebo control. Um, so our first aim was to make sure that this was safe and well tolerated. Um, we assessed this by steady dropout rate, vital sign monitoring, clinical chemistry labs in blood, um, uh, um, EKG, and um, the DOTS, which is a, um, a side effects scale that some um, clinician filled out. Um, our second goal was to test whether four weeks of BID, meaning twice a day intranasal vasopressin treatment, improved social abilities in children with autism. And so we used the social responsiveness scale as our primary endpoint. Um, but this is a, a scale that parent feels, uh, parents fill out. And so we wanted to also have convergent validation of our finding, which included um, clinician report on the CGI and also patient performance themselves on laboratory-based laboratory, uh, laboratory -based social cognition tests. So what we found was that vasopressin-treated patients, there were none that dropped out during the study. And there were no differences in adverse events between these two groups of vasopressin-treated and placebo-treated children. Um, we also had the children who were on placebo went into open label extension at the end of the trial. So we have good safety data um, from 30 children um, at the present time. Um, all of this is published, by the way, um, in Science Translational Medicine. Um, so I'm gonna not belabor the point on the safety data, but it looked good. Um, and again, there was no significant changes in any of the other safety parameters that we cared about, including vital signs, clinical chemistry labs, or um, electrocardiogram during the vasopressin treatment. Um, and then excitingly, what we found was convergent evidence for vasopressin treatment efficacy. What we saw was a reduction in, uh, or an improvement here rather, um, in SRS total score um, in people that were treated um, with um, vasopressin, but not placebo. We saw an increase in the CGI. And we also saw that children were better at reading the mind and the eyes after four weeks of vasopressin treatment, and they were better at recognizing affect in, um, in pictures of people's faces. Okay, so I'm just gonna finish my talk by talking about the roadmap that we've constructed and where we are currently headed. So, we developed a valid model, identified a biomarker or a target. We confirmed the translation of the biology to patients, and we are currently working on um, multiplex protein profiles in spinal fluid that I would ultimately like to try to back out into blood, although it's not clear to me that will be possible. Um, we've launched this first successful um, vasopressin treatment trial. We are currently conducting a phase 2B larger vasopressin treatment trial as a single site with the hope that this can move into um, a phase 3 trial um, you know, fairly quickly thereafter. Um, we discovered this biomarker before symptoms emerge in neonatal human um, infants. Um, and then one thing that we would like to do is to confirm 
this in a epidemiological multi-site neonatal CSF and blood collection consortium where we have some very nice data. So even though CSF and blood levels of vasopressin don't seem to be correlated later in life, we have some very nice pilot data suggesting a very high correlation between CSF um, and blood levels of vasopressin in the neonatal period, suggesting, um, and that's very likely due to development of the blood-brain barrier. Um, and so the idea would be that we might be able to identify this CSF-based signature and then see if we can see this in blood, which would allow um, more routine clinical monitoring. Um, and then we've done, I didn't talk about this, this work is unpublished, we have some beautiful data in rhesus monkeys showing that we can alter many core features of autism by administering vasopressin, including aspects of face recognition, joint attention, um, species specific responses to um, social cues, including pro-social initiation. And what I'd like to do next is we've got these neonatal rhesus monkeys that we know are at high risk for poor um, developmental outcomes. And what I'd like to do is treat them with vasopressin to see if we can alter their developmental outcomes so they don't um, develop this low social phenotype. So I just want to um, conclude by thanking the many collaborators who've made the work possible, the various mentees who've trained with me, the techs and RAs and many undergrads, and particularly um, the patients and families who have um, heroically participated in a lot of this work, um, all of the funding that we've received for it, um, and for the wonderful invitation to speak to you guys today, and then also you for your attention. And I'm happy to take questions. I don't know how we are on timing. Yeah, I think we're, um, we got a half fat world. We're supposed to come back at 12.30 for lunch. So I don't think maybe you can answer the questions to the Q&A if possible. So we can get a little lunch and get back on track at 12.30 if that's okay. Yeah. But thanks for that really wonderful and very well put together uh, presentation. Very impressive and comprehensive. Thank, Thank you, you so much, uh, Dr. Fry, for um, spending all 